And joining us now is Mr. Justice Harvey Brownstone of the North Toronto Family Court and author of Tug of War, a judge's verdict on separation, custody battles, and the bitter realities of family court. It's good to have you back here. You were here a couple of weeks ago with our other judges group, and nice to have you back in that seat this time. Thank you. Let me share some numbers which you know all too well, but which our viewers may not. The divorce rate in this province is 37%, all marriages ending in divorce by the 30-year mark, and nationally, 38.3% percent of all marriages ending by the 30 anniversary mark. Uh, Judge Brownstone, what brings people into your court? Well, I think it's important to note, first of all, that you just mentioned the divorce rate. If you were to count the couples that just live together, common law, who never did get married, the breakup rate for those people is untrackable. But everyone suspects that it's much, much higher than 38 percent. So the numbers we're dealing with are higher than these for sure. Much higher than that and I think that really it's a public health issue. There is such a large epidemic of family breakdown and conflict between parents that's clogging family courts everywhere. And when they see you, what is it that they want to see you about? Well I think what they think they want to see the judge about is to get some satisfaction for what they feel has been a wrong done to them. Uh, what the judge wants them to be talking about is what needs to be done for the best interest of their children. We're looking at parenting plans here for children when their parents have split up. But unfortunately, and that's why I wrote the book, uh, unfortunately parents who come to court very frequently are so obsessed with the pain and the anger and the feeling of betrayal at the end of the relationship uh, towards each other that they are unable to focus on their needs to reinvent themselves from ex-partners to co-parents. Is that understandable? It's very understandable. I think anyone who's ever broken up from a relationship uh, usually has some degree of bitterness towards their ex-partner. But the difference, I think, with the people who come to court is that they've been unable to move beyond it, to put aside that emotional baggage and accept that the person that they've chosen to have children with may not have been a very good parent. Uh, a very good partner, but could be a very good parent. And, they, uh, and people that have difficulty distinguishing between their ex as a, as a partner and as a parent very frequently have great conflicts over their children. And so they come to court and expect total strangers, who are trained in the law, by the way, not social work, not child psychology, or we're not counselors or therapists, to make decisions about their children. And on top of all of that, we rely on the parents to give us the evidence that we need to make the best possible decision and frequently, well, in Toronto and in most of the large centres in Canada, we're looking at 70% of litigants with no lawyers. People represent themselves. They represent themselves either because they can't afford legal representation or they've watched Judge Judy on TV and they think that <laughs> no one has a lawyer on that show, why can't they come there and just tell their story and then the judge will give them a decision. Do you prefer it that way when people represent themselves? I think any judge will tell you that people who try to represent themselves are making a huge mistake because the court system was never designed to be navigated uh, by people with absolutely no training or legal advice. And what happens is uh, that people quickly learn that there's, there's rules, there's rules of evidence, there's rules of procedure, there's substantive mm -hmm. law. And uh, without any idea of how to navigate that system, it's extremely difficult and very frustrating. Is it all about access by the time they get to you? Is that what they fight about? Uh, they fight about custody, mm -hmm. they fight about access, they fight about financial matters, of course, and of course there are people that fight about property too. Hmm. The difference though, I think, between family type litigation and just general litigation um, is that uh, it's driven by emotions. It's not uncommon to see parents fight over garden furniture that they could go to Walmart and buy for a fraction of what they've spent on legal fees. But it's not about the furniture, of course. It's sticking it to the other side. I and guess. I would say that even in custody cases, very frequently the impression I get, and judges talk about this all the time, it's not about the children <laughs> either. It isn't even about the children. The parents uh, are in a battle for power and control and vengeance. Mm -hmm. And I've had custody cases routinely where the parent, the children are barely mentioned. Well, presumably when they're in your court, you have to give them a dressing down at some point and say, look it, we're actually not here to refight the details of your divorce. Can I get you, please, to focus on the needs of your children? How do you do that? I think we do it just the way you say it. Yeah. Uh, the difficulty is that uh, uh, people are at, at a very heightened emotional state when they're in court. They're not at their best. And it's very stressful and it's very painful. And so uh, I don't know how much of what judges say actually gets absorbed. That's why I wrote this book, to try to get people 
before they launch themselves into these catastrophic, protracted, high-conflict lawsuits over their children uh, where nobody wins. Everyone thinks they're going to win, and then nobody wins in family court. There's only degrees of losing in family court. No winner. And the biggest losers are the children, by the way. Mm. Um, that's why I thought if they could read something from a judge beforehand, maybe they would be able to be a little more informed when they come in front well, of a judge. What percentage of people, mothers and fathers, who leave your court, I mean, this is an estimate, I'm sure. There's no scientific study on this. What percentage do you think are satisfied that you've actually found the balance and they can move forward with their lives reasonably vis-a-vis -vis their children? Probably zero. No kidding. I, I Nobody would, leaves happy? I don't think anyone, uh, I've been a judge 14 years, I did family law a long time before then. I don't think anybody who's gone through the family justice system will tell you that it was a positive experience or that uh, the system was uh, uh, easy for them to, to experience. And I think every couple that's had to litigate uh, have more negative feelings about each other at the end of the case than they did at the beginning. So is that a comment on the system or just the fact that they're, as you pointed out, they're in such a heightened state of, you know, unhappiness at the time? I think it's a comment on the system to the extent that it's an adversarial process. You know, um, judges are lawyers. We are trained in the law, but when two parents can't agree on which school their child's going to go to, uh, uh, how, what days you're going to have the child, what days I'm going to have the child, those are not legal issues. Those are issues of communication and compromise. These people need to find a way to make decisions together. And that's not going to happen in a courtroom, which is a very adversarial process. You'd be the exact right person to ask this next question to, and that is that I, I have been told, of course, by numerous men over the years who have gone through family court or gone through a divorce situation, that the family court system is very stacked against men and in favor of women. Would you say that's true? Let me tell you, first of all, that everybody that comes to court feels like a victim. I have never met a parent yet that didn't tell me that they were the victim. Everybody feels that they were the hard done by one in the relationship. Uh, I would also say to you that there is this wide perception, mostly because the same court order that contains child support contains custody and access provisions. There's an entire government department out there that enforces support orders. They can suspend your driver's license, you can be sent to jail, uh, but there is no government agency that enforces access. Hmm. And that's because children are not pieces of property that you can garnish -y or seize. Uh, it's much more complicated. They're human beings. And so there is a, a sense out there that uh, the system doesn't really value fathers. And I also think that the, uh, the reality is that very, very few fathers ask for custody. Mm -hmm. And so the perception that very few fathers ever get custody is uh, not quite accurate when you consider that you have to ask for custody okay. before you get it. But if I'm reading between the lines, given the way you've just described it, uh, the men who believe this may not be totally wrong, right? I think the men that believe it have a perception that is real to them. As a judge, I can tell you there is no gender bias in the court system because we're, we're not interested in the rights of parents. We're interested in the obligations of parents and the rights of children, and we don't mm. care what sex they are. What percentage of... <coughs> children end up in the custody of their mothers? I don't know, but I would say to you that 95% of, uh, of cases that we see, the mother asked for custody and the father didn't. Hmm. So therefore the mother got. That's the way it goes. Take a sip. You and I are both suffering through a cough right now, a nasty cough, so take a sip of water. Um, is, the, is the nature of the kind of case that you're seeing over the course of the 14 years that you've been doing what you've been doing, has it changed? Yes, I think that we're seeing much more high-conflict battles between parents than we used to see. Hmm. We are seeing uh, anger, <laughs> we're seeing betrayal, we're seeing uh, a desire to get children involved in these disputes. And that is, uh, it's very, very harmful to children. Parents need to understand that their children, when children witness their parents fighting hmm. or arguing, that is child abuse. Hmm. That is a form of child abuse because they are at risk of emotional harm. And so, when, when, when parents are unable to, to deal with all of that, that, that emotional baggage they've got at the end of the relationship and impose it on the children, they are subjecting their children to in, in an impossible conflict of loyalties. I don't know if this is a, a stereotype here, but is it fair to say that when there's a breakup of a family and when you have to deal with issues around custody and access <coughs> and so on, 
Do men generally behave one kind of way in court and women another kind of way in court? Absolutely not. No. Both parents, uh, alienating behavior happens mm -hmm. uh, on both sides. Uh, uh, there is good behavior and bad behavior on both sides. I, I, I don't think that mothers or fathers are any better or worse. Uh, uh, I think that people who are in emotional turmoil mm -hmm. are, are, uh, may behave badly, whether they're men or women. If you are a child abuser, or if you, if, no, that's too strong, if you have abused your child at some step along the way, is that an automatic, you're out of the, you're out of the picture now, forget about access, forget about all that other kind of stuff? I think there, uh, it, it, it depends. The answer is that it depends. Uh, yeah. If a child has been traumatized by a parent, uh, the court is going to be very uh, careful and cautious about what kind of contact, if any, the parent should have with the child. Sure. Uh, but it, it, is not, it is not true that every instance of abuse will uh, result in a termination of the parental relationship. It really does depend on what happened, what was the uh, impact on the child, has the parent learned anything from it. We may order supervised access, for example, where, they, where, where the access takes place at, a, at, a, at an access center, staffed by government employees who are watching and taking notes hmm. and making sure that the child feels safe and comfortable. How about spousal abuse? Domestic violence has to be considered by law uh, in every custody case. And so the court would want to know, uh, did the children witness it? Um, uh, what was the nature of it? Was it a one-time thing? Was it a pattern of ongoing violence? But it has to be considered. Hmm. Do you ever wonder, when these people come before you in court, do you ever look at them and say, you know, once upon a time, you two actually <coughs> loved one another? Oh, I say that all the time. You do. In fact, I find it amazing that they could hate themselves, uh, they, they hate each other so much that they would let a total stranger decide what's going to happen to their children. Hmm. And I tell parents all the time, you need to love your children more than you hate each other. Because if you did, you would make compromise, you would make peace for your children for the sake uh, of your children's uh, stability in their lives. Because having peace for your children is more important than being right. And I do tell them, you know, um, you need to build on whatever was good in that relationship, whatever drew you to each other. I mean, you chose each other to have children with. You need to build on that because you're going to have to deal with each other for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Presumably, there are a lot more people now who are going through alternative dispute uh, mechanisms and resolutions and um, other ways of resolving their conflicts. So w why is your courtroom still as busy as it is? Well, some of the alternative dispute resolution, resolution uh, mechanisms are not cheap. Now, we are lucky in Toronto, both family courts have a, a full-time mediator at the Ontario Court of Justice level, full-time, and mediation is a wonderful option. Uh, it's not right for everyone, and if there's a, a strong power imbalance, it will not work, but for many, many, many couples, mediation <laughs> is a very good option. And, uh, and the other alternatives that I discuss in the book, like collaborative law, mm -hmm. parenting coaching, you have an excellent parenting coach tonight on your panel, Dr. Fiddler, who's one of the best. Uh, I think that is far, far more appropriate for parents to try to learn a new way to re redefine their relationship and, uh, and, and find a way to make decisions uh, for their children and not give up all that power to, to, to a judge who has very little time. You know, a lot of people don't realize we don't meet the children unless there's something very unique, hmm. very unusual. The general practice in family court is that we don't meet the children about whom we're making all these decisions. You've never had a child on a stand and interviewed the child or questioned the child? I have, but it's rare. Uh, sometimes we will appoint a lawyer for the child. Sometimes there's an assessment done by a psychologist or a social worker that will tell us what the child's uh, views and preferences are, but very rarely will the judge hmm. meet a child. And so I say to the parents, you know, you're, when, when your child grows up, you're going to have to explain to them that you hated each other so much that a total stranger had to make this decision. When I think children are entitled to have their parents make these decisions together because they know the children and we don't. When you put it that way, does it embarrass them into better behavior? Sometimes. 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 Yeah. I, I, sometimes a parent will, will, will get what I'm saying. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've had hundreds and hundreds of letters since the book came out tell from parents telling me that it made them shift their attitude a little bit because they didn't know the system was as brutal as it is. Mm -hmm. But the justice system is really quite brutal. It's a difficult, hard, time-consuming system uh, that really can, uh, can destroy people's lives. In our last 30 seconds before we go join Dr. Fiddler and others on the other side of the studio, since you've seen so much of this, again, you're the right guy to ask, is divorce without conflict realistic? 
Absolutely. It is. Yes. In fact, we are told that 90% of couples who break up never go anywhere near a courtroom. They come to terms, they work it out, they have a separation agreement, and they never see a judge. But it's the 10% that do have those problems, uh, and they're a very sizable 10%. Uh, that keep the courts very busy. But it's absolutely possible to be business-like and civilized with your ex, even if you're not best friends. You could be friendly. Judge Bernstone, we thank you for, first of all, writing the book, Tug of War, and discussing it today. We're going to go over to the other side of the studio and continue our discussion about uh, something called parental alienation syndrome, which is no doubt uh, something that keeps you up late at nights. This is a, a very, very tough topic involving parents and children. So if you would, join me on the other side of the studio now.